The Alabama Supreme Court ruled that embryos created through in vitro fertilization are considered living children. And the craziest thing is they might be right. The court based its decision on the state's fetal personhood amendment, which says that life begins at conception and that the state must act to protect all unborn life. Alabama voters passed the personhood amendment in 2018, but it was largely toothless because of the rights conferred by Roe versus Wade and Planned Parenthood versus Casey and its progeny. But when the US Supreme Court overturned those decisions in Dobbs versus Jackson, it removed the guardrails. Now Alabama and other states with similar amendments can regulate women's reproductive rights in any way that they choose. And in the wake of the Alabama Supreme Court's decisions, many Alabama clinics have halted IVF procedures out of fear that quote, patients and our physicians could be prosecuted criminally or face punitive damages for following the standards of care for IVF treatments. So patients are now in limbo. Since few insurance companies fully cover fertility treatments, many of these patients have already paid thousands of dollars for procedures that have been delayed or outright canceled. Some patients are scrambling to transfer frozen embryos to clinics out of state. And meanwhile, when a reporter asked Senator Tommy Tuberville about the decision of his state Supreme Court, he seemed to have little or no understanding of what IVF actually is. To the Alabama Supreme Court ruling on the fact that embryos are children. Yeah, I was all for it. When Tuberville was told that IVF helps people have children and that some clinics have paused the procedure as a result of the ruling because they don't want to be criminally prosecuted, uh, he says, it, I thought this was the right thing to do, but. but IVF is used to have more children and right now IVF services are paused at some of the clinics in Alabama. Aren't you concerned that this could impact people who are trying to have kids? Well, that's for that's for another conversation. People need to have that. We need more kids. We need the people to, to have the opportunity to have kids. Alrighty then. Uh, so today we're actually going to help the Senator from Alabama by explaining the consequences of that court's decision. Now this Alabama ruling raises many questions such as if frozen embryos are children, then is it acceptable for them to remain on ice for decades or do they have to be implanted into a uterus? Uh, what about embryos with genetic abnormalities? Must they remain frozen? Can they ever be discarded without charging someone with murder? What are the implications for contraceptives that prevent the implantation of an egg? If an embryo has personhood status, do child endangerment statutes apply during fertility treatments? If personhood begins from the moment a sperm meets an egg, do child support obligations begin at that moment? I'm just kidding. That would be bad for men, so that's obviously not going to be a thing. But let's start at the beginning. What is IVF? IVF starts with injecting a person with hormones to stimulate an ovary to produce multiple eggs. The eggs are collected and combined with sperm outside of the body. The eggs are placed in an incubator for about five days where they become embryos. The number of embryos created is unpredictable. After five days, the clinic assesses the embryos to decide if they're suitable for transfer into a uterus. Not all embryos uh, fertilize normally. Some eggs do not fertilize at all, some don't fertilize normally, and some fertilized eggs have genetic abnormalities. Embryos that are good quality will be transferred into a uterus or frozen for future attempts. But this is one of the many ways in which IVF necessarily involves the destruction or discarding of some, if not all, of the fertilized embryos. And IVF treatments are expensive, uh, between $15,000 and $20,000 per cycle. People who undergo IVF treatments uh, sign contracts with the medical providers, which dictate what should happen to their embryos. They can be frozen, donated to other people, discarded as medical waste, or used in medical research. Some of these contracts include provisions limiting the clinic's liability for loss. And what happened in one particular IVF clinic was a very unusual scenario that gave rise to this particular case. In December of 2020, a hospital patient at the Mobile Infirmary Medical Center entered an adjoining IVF storage facility through an unsecured door, removed several frozen embryos, and then dropped the embryos on the floor because of freezer burns to their hand. The embryos were destroyed. The three plaintiffs in this case were couples who had signed contracts with the IVF clinic that treated their embryos like property and waived their rights to sue the clinic. However, these plaintiffs claimed that the clinic was negligent and as a result, their quote, embryonic children, quote, began to slowly die. They sued the hospital and the IVF clinic for wrongful death under a separate statute. The trial court agreed with the defendants that an embryo is not a person for the purposes of wrongful death lawsuits because Alabama's homicide and wrongful death statutes define person as a human being that is at a minimum in utero. So one of the issues in the Alabama Supreme Court was whether a frozen embryo, which is by definition not in utero, qualifies as a child for the purposes of the wrongful death of a minor act. Now you might be asking, what about the contracts between the clinic and the patients? Wouldn't that waiver prevent them from suing under tort law? Now, typically you would expect the court to resolve that issue first, but the Alabama Supreme Court chose to discuss the issue at the end of its opinion. Quote, all the plaintiffs signed contracts with the center in which their embryonic children, 
we'll talk about that phrasing later, were in many respects treated as non-human property. The Fonda has elected their contract to automatically destroy any embryos that had remained frozen longer than five years. The LePages chose to donate similar embryos to medical researchers whose projects would result in the destruction of the embryos. And the ISENS agreed to allow any abnormal embryos created through IVF to be experimented on for research purposes and then discarded. The defendants contended at oral argument that these provisions are fundamentally incompatible with the plaintiff's wrongful death claims. Now, generally courts of appeal refuse to decide complex constitutional issues if the case can be resolved on narrower grounds specific to the facts of the case. And the Alabama court admitted that in this case, it could have been decided that way. Quote, if the defendants are correct on that point, then they may be able to invoke waiver, estoppel, or similar affirmative defenses. A waiver is the voluntary relinquishment or surrender of some known right or privilege. Estoppel is the doctrine that prevents someone from arguing something or asserting a right that contradicts what they have previously said or agreed to by law. And in this case, the clinic wanted to argue that the plaintiffs entered into a contract where they agreed with the premise that the embryos were property and the clinic then performed services based on that understanding. And now the plaintiffs can't go back and reset the terms of that relationship. However, the Supreme Court chose to delve into the personhood instead because quote, those defenses have not been briefed and were not considered by the trial court. We will not attempt to resolve them here. In other words, the court wanted to decide the much more complicated question of whether frozen embryos are babies. Now, if you're a woman in Alabama, it looks like you're going to need a great lawyer. Yes, just in general. But my firm, The Eagle Team, can help. If you've suffered from sexual harassment, were in a car crash, or were part of a data breach, especially if you got one of those data breach letters, we can represent you or help find you the right attorney. It's so important to talk to a lawyer right away so you don't lose your chance for a full recovery and you maximize your options. So just click on the link in the description for free consultation with my team. Because you don't just need a legal team, you need the Eagle team, so click below. So the wrongful death of a minor act in Alabama allows parents to sue for punitive damages after the wrongful death of a minor. It states, when the death of a minor child is caused by the wrongful act, omission, or negligence of any person, persons, or corporation, or the servants or agents of the either, the father or the mother as specified in section 6-5-390, or if the father and mother are both dead, or if they decline to commence an action or fail to do so within six months from the death of the minor, the personal representative of the minor may commence an action. The act was passed in 1872 when there was no such thing as IVF. Its text doesn't define children to include frozen embryos. However, the second sentence of the court's decision frames the issue this way, quote, the central question is whether the act contains an unwritten exception to the rule for extra uterine children, that is unborn children who are located outside of a biological uterus at the time they are killed. Under existing black letter law, the answer to that question is no, the wrongful death of a minor act applies to all unborn children, regardless of their location. As the lone dissenting justice points out, none of the parties suggested that there was an unwritten exception excluding frozen embryos because that would have assumed the definition of a child already included them. But the majority opinion immediately called frozen embryos, quote, extra uterine children, uh, claiming that they were living in, quote, cryogenic nurseries, and then declared that they are the same thing as unborn children. And it took the majority 24 pages to explain exactly why frozen cells that look like this are the same thing as a baby. And the court relies on two sources for its decision. The 1864 Webster's Dictionary, which was in circulation at the time the Wrongful Death Act was passed, and the Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs. Webster's at the time defined child as, quote, the immediate progeny of parents. The 1864 version of the dictionary indicated that, quote, this term encompassed children in the womb which of course does not really support the court's conclusion. But the Alabama court relied on the US Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs uh, that in the 18th century, the unborn were widely recognized as living persons with rights and interest. Now, as an aside, that aspect of Dobbs is problematic because there are also sources of law indicating that unborn children did not have the same rights as people even after birth. But even if we accept this aspect of Dobbs as true, it still doesn't compel a conclusion that unborn indicates children outside of a uterus. However, Dobbs doesn't preclude such a finding either. Unlike the Roe case or Casey, Dobbs doesn't guarantee women any rights, including the right to an abortion. So another question is how is a person defined at common law and in criminal statutes in Alabama? The Alabama court held that the act quote, applies to all children without exception or limitation and that plaintiff's alternative claims for negligence and wantonness were moot. The court could have allowed these plaintiffs to sue for negligence on the basis that the clinic and the hospital should have had better security procedures, but that wouldn't have required the court to conclude that the embryos were children. And to reach that result, the justices had to repudiate their own precedent without expressly overruling it. 
The defendants argued that the definition of a person under state criminal and common law does not encompass frozen embryos. For example, in 1977, Alabama repealed its previous criminal homicide statutes and replaced them with a statute which defined the word person as, quote, a human being who had been born and was alive at the time of the homicidal act. In 2006, the state enacted the Brody Bill, which changed the definition to include fetuses in utero. Quote, the term, when referring to the victim of a criminal homicide or assault, means a human being including an unborn child in utero at any stage of development, regardless of viability. But the majority opinion says that the textual definition of person in criminal law is irrelevant because, quote, the criminal law has always been out of step with the treatment of prenatal life in other areas of law, in that it generally prioritizes lenity towards the accused over otherwise applicable civil rights of unborn children. The opinion uh, does not cite any Alabama law for this assertion. And the source for the statement is, of course, the U.S. Supreme Court's decision in Dobbs. Now, after the passage of the Brody Act, the court decided a case called Mack versus Carmack. In Mack, the court held unanimously that a wrongful death action can be brought when someone injures a pregnant woman, resulting in the miscarriage of her non-viable child. The Mack court noted that it would be, quote, incongruous if a defendant could be responsible criminally for the homicide of a fetal child, but would have no similar responsibility civilly. In that case, the court reaffirmed, quote, the need for congruence between the criminal law and our civil wrongful death statutes. Five years later, the Supreme Court decided Stennett versus Kennedy. And in that case, the court explained that, quote, borrowing the definition of a person from the Criminal Homicide Act to inform us as to who was protected under the Civil Wrongful Death Act made sense. But now the Alabama Supreme Court says that the definition of child for purposes of the Wrongful Death Act does not need to be congruent with this definition of child in criminal and civil contexts. And they might not be wrong about that. Why? Because a state Supreme Court is bound by the state's constitution. And in 2018, Alabama passed a ballot measure called the Sanctity of Unborn Life Amendment. So now Article 1 of the Alabama Constitution of 2022, quote, acknowledges, declares, and affirms that it is the public policy of the state to ensure the protection of the rights of the unborn child in all manners and measures lawful and appropriate. Now, the Alabama Personhood Amendment doesn't define unborn child. However, the court says the amendment requires the courts to err on the side of giving the unborn as many rights as possible, going so far as to call the amendment a, quote, constitutionally imposed canon of construction. Now, the sole dissent from Justice Greg Cook points out that uh, this isn't required because neither the text of the amendment or uh, any other authority supports such a rule of construction. And he argued that the personhood amendment is irrelevant to the definition of child or person. Quote, if the legislator wanted to change the words in the statute, they should have changed the words in the statute. But on the other hand, the amendment is incredibly broad and the majority rejected Justice Cook's interpretation, holding that, quote, the upshot here is that the phrase minor child means the same thing in the wrongful death of a minor act as it does in everyday parlance. An unborn or recently born individual member of a human species from fertilization until the age of majority. But not surprisingly, the phrase from fertilization until the age of majority opens up a huge Pandora's box. Not all fertilized eggs fully implant in the uterus. In fact, between one third and one half of all fertilized eggs never implant. And the decision in this case would make implantation irrelevant. Under the court's opinion, if an egg is fertilized, then it is a human life, even if it is so abnormal that it would never produce a pregnancy. And if that's really the case, then it really could be illegal for Alabama IVF clinics to discard any single fertilized embryo. And that's the main reason why clinics halted IVF procedures. It's functionally impossible to do IVF without discarding at least some of the embryos. Now, many have reported this opinion incorrectly, stating that the Alabama courts have made IVF illegal, leading many politicians to say that they support IVF. But that's not what happened. The Alabama courts gave blastocysts functional personhood, which makes IVF de facto impossible, just not de jure impossible. And there's an argument that child endangerment and child support statutes would apply during IVF treatments. And that's really just the tip of the iceberg. A person could also logically argue that they should be able to claim a tax credit for any embryo, though the Alabama Supreme Court rejected the idea that it should consider the policy implications of its decision. Quote, it's not the role of this court to craft a new limitation based on our own view of what is or is not wise public policy. Just as Will Sellers, who concurred in the result in part, but dissented in part, accused the majority of policymaking, quote, to equate an embryo stored in a specialized freezer with a fetus inside of a mother is engaging in an exercise of result-oriented intellectual sophistry, which I'm unwilling to entertain. And while the majority opinion is interesting enough on its own, I wanna to briefly touch on what Chief Justice Tom Parker said in his concurring opinion. Now, a concurring opinion doesn't carry the force of law. It's when a particular justice agrees with the outcome of the case, but wants to add in something extra. And here, the extra thing that the justice wanted to add was the Christian God, because there's just not enough of that in Alabama. Uh, the chief justice said that, although there are plenty of legal sources affirming that the unborn are legally equivalent to people who are born, the court said it should base its opinion on authority higher than the constitution. 
namely Jesus Christ and the Christian God. Quote, but the principle itself, that human life is fundamentally distinct from other forms of life and cannot be taken intentionally without justification, has deep roots that reach back to the creation of man in the image of God. Genesis 1.27, King James. Quote, human life cannot be wrongfully destroyed without incurring the wrath of a holy capital G God who views the destruction of capital H his image as an affront to capital H himself. Yes, those are sentences in a legal opinion from a chief justice in the United States of America in 2024. Now, in this case, the court stops short of saying that frozen embryos have full constitutional rights. And if you want to read this decision narrowly, then all the court is saying is that for the purposes of this particular wrongful death law, frozen embryos are considered children. And we'll have to wait and see how this plays out in other Alabama cases. However, you can also read this decision more expansively and use it as precedent to argue that the destruction of any embryo that is not in utero is also criminal. And that's why clinics pause their IVF treatments because they're concerned about civil and criminal liability. There's a huge amount of uncertainty there. And despite the personhood amendment, the person who dropped the frozen embryos in this case is not being criminally prosecuted. Probably because there's precedent that under Alabama's criminal homicide statute, the term criminal only applies to unborn children in utero. But it's also probably only a matter of time until that particular statute gets reinterpreted in light of the 2018 personhood amendment. But the potential for criminal charges is not theoretical. Alabama Attorney General Steve Marshall said he wouldn't arrest anyone for IVF, and Marshall previously said he would not arrest women for having an abortion, but he said he would arrest them for chemical endangerment if they used abortion medication. The state's chemical endangerment law applies to any adult who exposes children to, quote, an environment in which controlled substances are produced or distributed. The law was intended to punish parents who expose the born living children to harmful chemicals like drugs, but has increasingly been used to punish women who consume anything that could be harmful to a fetus, including abortion medication. Now, Alabama legislated its way into the situation and it may try to legislate its way out of the situation. Alabama legislators are racing to create an exception to their life begins at conception rhetoric that would allow for life to be destroyed during IVF. The Alabama legislature passed a bill to protect IVF doctors from criminal prosecution. However, even if Governor Kay Ivey signs the bill, there's still many unresolved legal questions because of the constitutional amendment. State Senator Tim Melson explained it like this, quote, we all know that conception is a big argument that it's life. I won't argue that point, but it's not going to form into a life until it's put into the uterus. Melson said in the quintessential Alabama fashion, quote, when a lady has two or three successful pregnancies, and these are left over, it's just time to make sure that they aren't penalized for success. Now there might be a federal legislative solution here, but I wouldn't hold my breath. In the wake of the Alabama decision, uh, many members of Congress have reaffirmed their support for IVF, but many of those same people uh, support the Life at Conception Act, the current version of which would establish that life begins at fertilization. That had 125 Republican supporters in the House in 2023, including Speaker of the House Mike Johnson. And that bill currently does not include an exception for IVF though the Senate version of that bill does. But the bottom line is there's no limiting principle in the Dobbs decision that would rule out the criminalization of IVF in any particular state. In fact, one of the explicit things that Dobbs did was to allow states to create bespoke laws governing reproduction, resulting in vastly different outcomes depending on where you live. In fact, in Louisiana, a human embryo is already considered a juridical person with some rights. And as a result, IVF doctors cannot destroy embryos in that state. So if you live in Louisiana or Alabama and have a uterus, now might be a good time to scrub all information about yourself off the internet, which you can do with today's sponsor, Incogni. Uh, Incogni removes your personal data from online data brokers. Data brokers sell your info to the highest bidder, resulting in loss of privacy, phone calls, texts, spam, email, and much, much worse. But Incogni will reach out to these data brokers and make them take your personal info down. If these data brokers fight back, which I've seen them try to do, Incogni will take care of that as well. It's a great way to cut down on those annoying scam calls and emails that used to flood my voicemail and inbox and increase your privacy online. Now, we've all Googled ourselves, you can admit it, but there are major people search sites out there that have way more info about you than just your high school football stats. These sites provide in-depth records, including information such as home addresses, contact details, license plate numbers, and financial information. But Incogni gets that information down and out of the hands of scammers and identity thieves. All you have to do is give them approval to work on your behalf. Incogni conducts repeated ongoing removals because even if the broker removes your data once, they could collect it again from a different source. But Incogni makes sure that your personal information stays off the market for good. It's fascinating for me to look at my dashboard and realize that I'm a hundreds of data brokers list. I feel so popular. So I guess it's no surprise why my email inbox is full of junk and my phone is constantly ringing with scam calls. Or maybe that's just Scowl Owl asking me for more hand-me-down suits. 
But here's my personal Incogni dashboard. It shows me that these three sites potentially have data on me that was rated 10 out of 10 on Incogni's sensitivity scale. These brokers had data including my contacts, my financial data, and health data. It's truly terrifying to see exactly how many brokers have data on me, but it's really fun to watch Incogni get them to delete that info one by one. So if online privacy is important to you, give Incogni a try. You can click on the link below to get 60% off Incogni when you use the code LEGALEAGLE. Again, to get an exclusive 60% off discount, just click on the link that's on screen right now or down in the description and use the code LEGALEAGLE. After that, click on this link over here for more Legal Eagle, or I'll see you in court.